Good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here uh, on this Friday afternoon, evening. Uh, I'm a little bit jet lagged, so I'm totally lost that we are Friday. I'm totally lost uh, what time we are, but I'm going to do my best not to talk Flemish and only English. Mm -hmm. So um, if I do talk uh, Flemish, I have my who will sign me. You know? <laughs> So um, I would like to thank uh, Peter Wall um, Institute for Advanced uh, Studies um, and of course um, Dr. Ipsi Ravlu and Dr. Stockler uh, for being the hosts and actually pushing this agenda forward. Um, I'm, I'm thankful and honored to be here because, um, as Osman already mentioned, um, I'm very passionate about what is ongoing. Uh, apart from sleep and typically developing children, I firmly believe that um, with, within the group of children that are atypically developing, there is much to learn and much, much more to be done. Um, so Peter Wall makes it uh, feasible for me to travel, and I enjoy traveling, and I enjoy being in Vancouver, especially the air. I have my plastic bag to capture some uh, Vancouver air. Um, so I'm looking forward to coming back, and I hope that I uh, provoke enough thoughts and that, especially for the parents that are present, that I can help uh, a little bit by being their voice um, and, and putting the agenda forward. So, um, the con consequences of chronic sleep deprivation. Now, throughout my talk, I'm hoping to educate with you a little bit in terms of sleep, not only sleep, as Osman said, I'm passionate about this night and uh, daytime uh, behavior and the interrelation about it. And that's why I think the key is in the sleep to treat. So um, my title could actually be Consequences of Poor Sleep, um, because it's going to cover actually any aspects of uh, non-optimal sleep. Uh, and you do not need a sleep expert to explain you that sleep uh, is important or it needs to be optimal because right now for me being jet lag, I know how I feel and if you didn't have a good night's sleep, you know the next day as well how you feel, how you behave and how you will perform. Imagine for these children having on a daily basis, on a nightly basis, not the optimal sleep. So, um, as I said, the objectives of today is a little bit of education in terms of uh, what is sleep and then um, I'll continue with uh, the night and daytime uh, behavior interrelation and then actually how we can uh, see this sleep to treat or how this sleep perspective can actually add into a new um, way of treatment uh, or a new venue in children with atypical development. So regarding sleep, I'm unaware of your uh, knowledge, but first of all, um, there's many, many questions left over, especially in terms of development. So um, apart from that, what we know is that the brainstem and the hypothalamus actually sign to the cortex. So within the brain, there's a lot of action ongoing. Namely, there are centers that um, increase or provoke this arousal and at the same time there's networks within the brain that inhibit this arousal. And actually these um, centers are um, being considered as a kind of a flip-flop switch. So a flip-flop switch that is um, influenced by internal factors as well as external factors. Internal factors might be temperature, you know, um, metabolic, brain, neurotransmitters, external factors. If you turn off the light right now, I will be the first one to doze off. So, um, and then I put it right on the spot because the light is a key one, especially the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's the size of a grain of rice. So, and it has over uh, 20,000, 50,000 neurons um, that are in that tiny little piece. And it actually is very important and dependent on that light. So melatonin is actually related, it's a direct connection with light. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is also commonly said to be our master clock. It's the one that will arrange most of our body functions. And as I just mentioned, the melatonin is one of them. And I come back to that melatonin and maybe one of uh, presentations will also address it on the adverse drug reactions or something and yeah, treatment. So, um, because this in adults, you see here about 2100, the melatonin situation starts 
and you can actually see in terms of all the clocks that are ticking within your body, you actually see around 7.30 that the melatonin secretion stops. So that is a key one and is commonly used in children with an atypical uh, development. So suprachiasmatic nucleus, your master clock actually making that circadian rhythm, making that 24-hour rhythm, but also interconnected to many more biological rhythms or clocks within your uh, body. Another aspect is a, a sleep drive or the homeostatic um, aspect of sleep. And as you can see here throughout development, you see that a two-year-old, five-year-old, ten-year-old, and fifteen-year-old, that when you develop, you also see that that sleep drive will um, change. And you can see that, as it is stated here, the sleep... Oops, I hope. So the sleep pressure actually um, will uh, increase, and more so, it will, yeah, pressure accumulates, accumulates more slowly during the day with increasing age. So that actually shows that you will become biologically uh, uh, tired and then eventually you will flip into that uh, sleep uh, uh, stage. And then actually when you are fully rested, then you will flip into that wake uh, stage. So the flip-flops, which is something that is quite key to pick up uh, throughout this presentation. And then as I said, it's not only the internal factors, but also external factors. And uh, one of them is uh, the light, but it's also the temperature, it's how you sleep, where you sleep, uh, the noise. All these elements actually will come into play and will actually help you to fall asleep or actually prevent you to fall asleep or make you fall, uh, awaken quite often. Imagine children with atypical development and their sleep ecology, their sleep environment. So sleep is being considered as a window on brain maturation, on brain development, and this is a slide uh, that should actually help you understand that. So you can see that sleep, in contrast to what most people think you do when you are uh, dead, you know, you have plenty of time to sleep dead, so now you need to be fully active. Um, well, actually, that's right, quite incorrect to do that because uh, sleep on itself is a highly active brain function and at times it is even more active than during the wake uh, state. So and you can see throughout this slide that it changes throughout your lifespan. So we have the REM sleep and the non-REM sleep. The REM sleep or the rapid eye movement sleep or the paradoxical sleep where you're breathing, your heart rate, everything increases, also your brain activity. But then again, paradoxically, you know, you're not expressing or exhibiting any of the behaviors. It's also considered as a sleep where we uh, tend to dream. So if something goes wrong uh, throughout that spinal cord, then you actually, that blocks uh, expressing or things that you're dreaming, then we talk about REM sleep uh, behavior disorder. And then the non-REM sleep on itself is even subdivided into three to four uh, stages. And it goes from lighter sleep all the way to deeper sleep. So when we are born, it's like a 50-50% um, of distribution of REM and non-REM sleep. And when we get older, you see that that proportion changes and that proportion of non-REM sleep stays quite substantive because that is actually also considered as a sleep, a restorative sleep. For children, it's quite important for the growth hormone uh, secretion. So this is important to re uh, restore and actually uh, grow and build your own uh, body and uh, the cognition, emotion, all developmental aspects. So um, the question or the thing that you should keep in mind is we sleep the most in a period where we actually learn the most. But I could say it the reverse. We learn the most in the period where we actually sleep the most. We develop the most when we actually sleep the most. Look at children, look at the amount of time they spend to sleep. And still there's so little known and so much uh, overlooked regarding sleep problems in children. So um, the main question um, any sleep researcher will have is how many hours do we need to sleep? Well, um, very few of us will risk to give you a fixed answer to that because we actually don't have a fixed answer to it. The only thing you can answer is you have slept enough, you know, when you wake up spontaneously and when your body has recovered, restored enough, 
So when biologically, actually, the flip-flop is ready to go to the wake state. But then again, the environment, the alarm clock, school time, extracurricular activities, etc., maybe not allowing us to sleep uh, the amount that we need to sleep. So this slide actually shows you at the age of one month, all the way till uh, 16 years old, that you have, uh, and I should have put it in color, the middle line is like 50%, but there is a huge variation. So there are children that will sleep more than other children. There are children that will sleep less than other children. And that makes answering the question, how much sleep do I need, very difficult. The best answer that we will give is you need to make sure that you can sleep as much as your body needs, as, as, well as, you, um, as long as you wake up refreshed, alert, you know, and you don't feel sleepy or uh, sleep deprived throughout the day. So. Um, that is quite hard in terms of children because that actually uh, relies on how you observe them, how you uh, uh, interpret their behavior. And with children, being uh, tired or sleepy can be either by very uh, um, uh, externalized behavior, but also by internalized behavior. It can be all over the place, or they can be drowsy and sleeping in your uh, car seat. So this is a bit a summary of normal sleep. Now allow me to go a little bit more in detail because I think uh, in terms of children with atypical development it's key that you understand what is actually happening in the brain. As I just said, and I'm just highlighting a couple of things, as I just said the brain is quite central here and the brain waves throughout sleep is it's not that it's non-activity but at times it is even more active than during waking. So let us just look at the wake state. So the arrow you can follow. This is actually an electroencephalogram where you can see the brain waves. And you can actually see that random fast alpha activity is uh, seen. And um, this is actually uh, what we would then uh, label as a wake or uh, wakefulness. And then actually, as I said, the sleep state is divided in that REM and non-REM. And now the non-REM sleep is considered to be in parallel with cortical development. And so the brain waves are quite important here. So what you see is you go to bed as an adult and you have your stage one, and then the stage one is ma mainly theta waves, and then it's like 4%, 5% of your total sleep time, the time that you will spend to sleep. And you see that your brain waves will gradually change when you go into that deeper sleep, that more restorative uh, sleep. So around one and a half to three months, we are able to uh, start differentiating this. And this is quite important, as I said, the non-REM sleep is in parallel with actually that cortical uh, development. The non-REM sleep stage two, you see the sleep spindles and the key complexes uh, pop up. So that is actually, again, related to uh, information processing. It is related to um, conserving your sleep. Um, the state of sleep and um, how you actually have the brain plasticity ongoing. Even up till today, they are um, uh, further dividing that non-REM sleep and the microstructure that we call them and into uh, cyclic alternating patterns. And that is small spindles that we see, small waves that we see returning and is actually also related to being protective of sleep. So your brain, your body is that perfectionist in making sure that the, the cells, that the brain, that your organ actually gets enough sleep or protects the sleep state. Okay. So uh, around six to nine weeks these pop up and end of six months. So those are actually also the period where circadian changes happen where you can see that children start to sleep through the night and you see these behavioral changes but it's also because in the brain many things happen and sleep can actually help us be in that window. So the non-REM sleep, now they're grouped together in the um, stage three and stage uh, four. So the delta waves and the sleep spindles and then the stage four, which is actually really uh, related to that um, restorative function of delta waves. So you really see that the waves, the brain waves are changing when you actually start 
and go into deeper sleep. So you, as an adult, you go from the lighter, staying deep, and then you go back up in the cycle, and then you have the REM sleep, which is again uh, different random fast saw-toothed uh, brain waves, and then you go, you go back into the next cycle, and on and on. So this is actually happening throughout your first life period, your sleep matures, your behavior matures, your brain matures, and that is actually a key element in atypical uh, developing children. So, or, and then in neonates, it's quite sleep, active sleep, and in the indeterminate uh, sleep. So a lot of things happen, and I'm very brief here, just to give you a basic uh, idea. So if I summarize this differently, and Dr. Ipsiropi uh, already showed you a hypnogram, so you have here stage one, stage two, stage three, four, REM sleep, and then when you actually go from one state to another state, and especially to the REM, you turn to move, and then it's actually uh, a movement that you can register throughout sleep. So without having the brain wave or electroencephalogram ongoing or polysomnography, what you can do is already, as any healthcare provider or parent, is look at the bedtime, the, the get-up time or the wake-up time, because that gives us an estimate of how much time a child spends in bed. We do look at the time that the lights are off and the child actually falls asleep. The sleep onset latency is kind of predictive of the quality and duration of the sleep. Then also at the end, you know, the get up time, wake up and being fully alert or the sleep offset time is even informative because as I said, it's a flip-flop switch and when it's actually fulfilled, the need is fulfilled uh, in terms of sleep, then you become fully alert. That's where I have problems with when I'm jet lagged. So the sleep inertia is my brain doesn't simply get to that wake state and that's where we as adults tend to go for coffee, you know, or do things that really make us or brain waking uh, up. So the sleep inertia is quite informative. And then actually based on sleep onset and offset, we can have an estimation of the time spent uh, to sleep, sleep period time, without knowing anything about the brain. So that gives us an estimate as a clinician, as a parent, you know, um, about the quantity of uh, sleep, the duration of sleep. Now for children, you know, as I said, a lot needs to happen on the microstructures of the long run and the REM sleep and the subdivisions and how it is divided throughout your day and then it needs to move to the night. You know, many things happen in that first period of your life. So, um, as you can see, and I showed it, you know, it's like at the beginning they have most of their deep sleep and towards the morning they have most of their light sleep. And the best example I can give you if you have children, when you come home from a party, and you take them out of the car, you know, at elementary school age, they are sound asleep, and you can do whatever you want, but they are not awake. If they wake up, you know, the best tip I can give you is actually the same rituals you would do at that time to make them calm, relax, and fall asleep again. But most of the time, they're so sound asleep because they're in that deep sleep. Now, why is it important um, to show you this? Well, Given all this information, as a sleep uh, clinician, it is informative to know when certain behaviors happen at what certain point in time throughout the night. Because as you can see, we can relate them to certain brain waves or to certain periods throughout the night. It would go into too much detail to tell you all about this, but this actually expresses you the quality of the sleep. And then adding to that, you know, it's the total um, sleep duration, sleep wake pattern, where does sleep fall within our 24 hour cycle? And especially in children with atypical development, it might be a completely circadian flaw. You know, so the sleep duration and in typically developing children, we all tend to see that they we see that they all tend to sleep less. Um, and then of course the new research questions are what happens to that sleep architecture, what happens to that non-run distribution and all those uh, stages. So the sleep regularity is another aspect that is key to pick up from our nighttime behavior. And as I said, something totally forgotten within sleep research is that wake up time. Most people study this falling asleep, but not, you know, do you wake up spontaneously? That's a key question. So it's about the opportunity to sleep. And in some cultures, it doesn't matter if you fall asleep in the sofa or in a group, or other cultures say you need to sleep separately in your own room. So the opportunity to sleep 
is um, important, especially for children, given to the fact that it is related to brain development and development of the child. So I think that for now I have convinced you that sleep is indeed a vital function, a vital behavior. You've got the ski course, passport course in sleep to now use your common sense to anything else that I'm going to tell you after this and advocate with us the importance of uh, sleep in children with atypical development. So let us have a peek at those nighttime behavior um, uh, relationship. As I said, there's a lot still to be known. Um, but then again, what we know in terms of learning and memory, well, your brain develops, you know, when you start talking, sitting, walking, it just, you know, it doesn't happen like this. It's because, like, every second there's 40,000 synapses ongoing and your brain is just forming non-stop and the key element there is sleep. So the white and the gray matter is continuously developing and the, the white matter even all the way into your adolescence uh, period. So your brain is really an important organ that is still being formed way after birth. Imagining those children that do not get the optimal sleep. So there's a lot of changes happening, structural, functional, behavioral ones. And for most of the developmental aspects, we can actually make a developmental profile when you need to walk, when you need to sit upright, when you need to talk, when you need to, to use your uh, full sentences. So that developmental profile is there in terms of sleep. Still a lot is uh, to be done with uh, study, and especially in terms of children with atypical development, a lot uh, is still an open question. So if I would summarize again uh, in terms of learning and memory, if sleep is restricted, and this was in adolescence, um, that you see that the areas in the brain that are involved with the talk, talk task at hand, uh, I almost said task at hand, and areas that are not involved with the task at hand actually hyperpolarize. So when sleep was restricted, those that actually are involved with the task become hyperpolarized so that you can still perform, that you can still maintain a good performance. In terms of deprivation and loss, um, either it's partial or it is complete, is it only REM sleep, is it non-REM sleep, so depending uh, uh, what happens, you uh, can see that the psychomotor abilities um, are getting worse, your reduced awareness, adaptive uh, skills become uh, worse, your learning capacity is worse off, and so on, executive functioning and the higher cognitive uh, functions. If your sleep is considered as poor, quote unquote, is it the quantity, the quality, or regularity is poor, then actually has been associated with uh, poor scholastic performance, problems with working memory, and you do not need, need to tell you that because you know if you haven't had a good sleep that you go like, oh, what was it again? So working memory, reasoning, comprehension, fluid intelligence, and the cap I just mentioned, so the cyclic alternating pattern. As I said, there is something ongoing in your brain that makes sure that if there's too much noise, um, uh, uh, there is um, interruption or in, in, uh, your sleep might be intruded, then this activity will preserve your sleep. The reverse happens also, another aspect happens also when you're like fully awake, but you're like deadly tired, your brain will eventually protect itself by making microsleeps. And that's where Chernobyl and all these big accidents happen because your brain is trying to you know, catch up that sleep that it needs because on the molecular level, on the neurotransmitter level, things need to happen to preserve its function. Fragmentation, either intrinsic or extrinsic, attention, executive dysfunctioning, disorder, and I think this is a key model in terms of chronic sleep uh, deprivation, um, uh, because children with sleep disorder breathing, especially the, the sleep apnea, um, has been widely studied. And it's a good model, there's a lot of animal models there as well, so it's a good model to look actually what fragmentation of sleep is doing. Unfortunately, you have the hypoxia, you have the arousal, so there's more components to it than just plain fragmentation. But nonetheless, it's a good model because actually um, what we've seen is that when these children are treated, their actual performance improves. So I think that's proof of the fact or the concept that sleep is important uh, in your performance, in your behavior. So, and uh, it was not only the apnea, the stopping of breathing, but also the snoring 
actually has been related to uh, scholastic problems and problems in terms of acquisition and recalling and that especially during childhood is not a key thing if you're not open to learning if you're not learning what is being uh, 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 taught to you or being expressed to you or shown to you then you know uh, also your behavior and the next um, uh, night might be influenced as well so these children with sleep disordered breathing um, are characterized by sluggish cognitive tempos, like they don't get really awake because they have that fragmented uh, sleep. Um, and then variable and irregular sleep, as I mentioned, we've shown in, in Chicago that actually increases the likelihood uh, of obesity. And if you are obese, your, your likelihood of sleep disorder breathing increases. And then we start, is it multiplicative or is it actually uh, uh, cumulative? So uh, the chicken and the egg, uh, it becomes quite clustered or blurred, but in the end, the night wake is linked, and if you treat one, we see that the other one improves. If we improve the other one, we see that the night time as well improves, so it goes in both ways. And then in terms of extension, very few studies have uh, been done in children um, with all these uh, uh, restriction, deprivation, or, or uh, fragmentation, because ethically we cannot really uh, have typically developing children have less sleep, especially if we know that it might affect their brain development and their uh, learning capacity. Now, extension, um, they've tried to have children extend their sleep with one hour, and what we've seen is that they only succeeded in extending it for half an hour, uh, but then again, in these children, their uh, vigilance increased, attention, memory, all those uh, skills or all those functions that are important to learn at school or in atypically uh, developing children to be open to have the behavioral treatments um, learned to you uh, will improve. So that is in terms of extension. And if it's sleep is poor, is deprived, is restricted, you actually see that performance goes actually down. So bottom line, inefficient daytime uh, behavior, variability in performance you can expect when sleep is not the quality it should be or not the duration it should be or not as regular as it should be. So sleep affects cognition, emotion and behavior, but also cognition, emotion and behavior will affect sleep. There are animal studies that actually show a local sleep enhancement, if I express it correctly, it's that with uh, having animals exposed to certain tasks that affect certain areas in the brain, they could actually create a flip-flop switch at that local area in the brain. So I think that's quite promising uh, because most of the studies um, related to this uh, learning and memory and, and consequences of uh, sleep or, or poor sleep have been, been pushed forward by, by sleep disorder breathing. Um, but most of these studies have assessment of the, the performance of the child after their sleep study. So it is sleep affecting cognition, but not as much cognition affecting the sleep. Um, so, uh, but we do know if we learn tasks before sleep, and we have a good sleep, that the tasks are better preserved or better learned. Um, so cognition, emotion and behavior, and if you had a fight with your partner, you know that your sleep will not be quite uh, all right that night maybe. So that, that is also proof of the concept that it goes both ways. In terms of REM and non-REM, I'm not going to go into detail, micro and microstructure. Um, as I said, those tiny little stimuls have been associated with our uh, learning capacity. Um, developmental profile of functioning, we do not know yet uh, at those different ages, how much different will the outcome be or how much different will the consequences be before now actually uh, come to agreement that inefficient daytime or variable performance is seen throughout the lifespan. The, another aspect is individual need and vulnerability. Um, I'm quite lucky that I can sleep on a flight and probably that's why jet lags are bad, but not as bad as some other people uh, might uh, suffer. So there is still that individual need because as I said, there's a huge variation also in sleep duration. So some people might uh, uh, have a need for a lot of sleep and others might have a need for less sleep. So affecting these people with different uh, uh, or poor sleep might have 
a different outcome as well. And then which functional domains, most of the studies will show an executive function or attention problems, which is quite common in, in, in children if you know the brain development. So plasticity is a key um, element here in terms of learning and memory. Don't un underestimate the capacity of the brain. So this is a very dense slide, and I go very rapidly through it, because um, what I want to uh, have you take home from this slide is that since it is a brain, it has, you know, it is attention, it is memory, it is all these separate functions, but in the end it is one person, it is one brain. It's the same for sleep, you know, you can have this sleep problem, but then the other sleep problems might be present as well, and it becomes my, uh, it might become um, difficult to, to disentangle everything, but the key from this slide is that disorders of initiating and maintaining sleep and disorders of excessive somnolence are the top complaint in typically and atypically developing children. And of course, it's all related, interrelated, and that's what this sh that slide shows. So the disomnias, um, the problems that actually the initiating, maintaining uh, sleep and the early awakenings versus the parasomnias, the behaviors that disrupt uh, your sleep or uh, show up in the middle of your uh, Sleep. And then again, uh, the sleep environment or the sleep in the races, sleep efficiency are actually also interrelated to all of these aspects. So, key message is that they are clustered together, they are related to a certain degree to each other, and that makes, especially in children with atypical development, uh, uh, quite uh, difficult, I think, to filter out what are we uh, looking at and what is actually uh, at hand. Another dense slide to show you. This is a model that tried to link all the elements that we know, parental problems, uh, psychosocial problems, um, health problems um, related to, so this is uh, family demographics, family dysfunction, uh, the person most knowledgeable, so the uh, psychopathology in the person, difficult temperament, child health, sleep problem, internalizing, and the same here, but externalizing. And what you see, all of these will add into uh, a certain degree will add into internalizing or externalizing problems. And especially, you know, the sleep problems come in. And again, you know, you see here for internalizing problems, it is your the person that is interacting with you mostly and then the negative parenting. So if you talk about daytime and nighttime behaviors, it is they are separately interrelated and then again interrelated as a total, and then you have to embed that within a certain context, within a certain parenting, within a certain society. And that's where we are at right now within pediatric uh, sleep. So again, to summarize, it is not only their frequency, which is quite mostly or commonly looked at, it's also their severity. Very few questionnaires look at the severity or the chronicity. You know, how chronic are either of these problems? Either you start from the daytime or you start from the nighttime or you start from the whole context around it. So again, the same um, uh, aspect on the one side that you cannot forget one related to the other one. And that is actually that co-occurrence morbidity, comorbidity that we are facing um, in these children. So summary is that if I can conceptualize it. So throughout your development, you have your duration of your sleep will actually affect what happens throughout that uh, sleep period, that behavior. And it will eventually pop up as problems with, in terms of arousal or problem, problems in terms of sleepiness or some nighttime behavioral problem. Mostly it will be initiating and maintaining sleep or the early awakenings, and it might be a non-optimal uh, total sleep time. And most of the clinicians or most of the healthcare providers will train your sleep hygiene, all those aspects that will promote sleep. You know, it's not having caffeine, it's having a comfort uh, area to sleep or environment to sleep, um, all these uh, aspects that might promote uh, sleep. Uh, and then you see, uh, in terms of um, health, um, throughout the studies, if I can summarize them, variability comes into play as well. So the variability, because it might affect the health if you're very unregular, like me now, going back and forth from, so I was in, I arrived here, then I flew back to Chicago, back to Vancouver, now we'll go to Europe again. So 
all these changes, this variability will likely affect my health and for me it's mostly my uh, eating habits um, but just maybe a couple of things and also my nose if I'm a small eater and I always go like oh not too much food because I know it disrupts but it might be any aspect, it might be uh, blood pressure um, so the health, the behavior, the, the duration, variability, arousal, and sleepiness it's all that way interrelated it's all connected to each other and you need to filter each of these elements to fully understand what you're looking at. So, in a quick nutshell, the night and daytime behavior, I think you're now pretty much convinced that it is linked and that if one is present, it's very likely that another one will be present as well. Um, and as I will show you now in the last part of the presentation, the sleep to treat which will focus on the children with an atypical development, all this will come into play in this puzzle's pieces. So the sleep to treat, well, as I said from the beginning, um, we know when the social smile, you know, your first smile, and we're proud of it, baby smiles at me. The first steps, we're proud of it. The first word, word we're proud of it. The first time they have their solid food, and you know, as a parent, all these elements, you know, you go like, wow, oh, my baby is doing this, and you're very proud, uh, which it sh because there are indicators that the child is developing well, the child is actually uh, on track. It's the same with sleeping through the night. If you have a school game, that will be like a key topic in terms of when you put your child to sleep, and mine is sleeping through the night, oh, first night that we can sleep as a parent. So, even though it is so important compared to all the other aspects in development, there's still so many questions unanswered. So, as I said from the beginning, sleeping is actually a key behavior, a key function uh, for a child. And actually it is engaged in sleeping more than in any other activity, more than in playing, more than in eating, and more than in social interacting. And still, there's so little attention paid to it. It. So the disturbance of sleep is, as I said, one of the most frequent child behavioral uh, problems reported by the caregiver. And the caregiver is key in terms of childhood. Um, and they need to become trained, as a healthcare professors, professionals need to be trained to become aware that you not only focus on the nighttime, but also on the daytime. If you see externalizing behaviors or internalizing behaviors, how is also that component around sleep, the more you look at the things that you have commonly traded in. Because the disturbance of sleep will depend on the caregiver because they will help you define it, they will help you in understanding what is the cause, and they might be the cause, and they might also be the ones that maintain the sleep uh, problem. So in terms of the measurement, it is quite important to keep that in mind because a complainant might be different from the sufferer and might be different from the observer. I gave a, a talk or a lecture in Shanghai and unfamiliar with uh, the bedtime rituals of infants, you know, I got this question, I really had to scratch my head, like how am I going to answer this question culturally correct? Uh, because I perceive it as an observer from my Western culture and how I would actually uh, uh, train or treat parents within the Western uh, culture. So that's an important aspect. Uh, in terms of defining a sleep problem and also in terms of treating the problem or the complaint or the disorder. And why is it? Because sleep is a primary activity for a child and it affects its 24. It's not only at night time, it's also at day time, day nap. So it affects not only the child but also the family and the community and it actually requires an interdisciplinary approach. So now specifically, uh, in a nutshell, uh, in terms of children with an atypical development, well, um, there's very few studies. Um, it's kind of booming right now, and I think Osman is a cause. Um, so um, the uh, uh, topic uh, is an eye-opener within the field of sleep, but what we actually should pay attention to is that within each of these syndromes, within each of these groups of children with atypical development, there's a huge variability within the same uh, type of, of uh, subject. And that makes it even more cumbersome, makes it even more difficult for us to fully grasp what is ongoing. So a couple of the, the aspects that I will try to puzzle here also fit for typically developing children. 
but are even more important for atypically developing children. So in terms of generalize, generalizability, what we know right now and how can we expand that knowledge to other disorders or other treatments or other ways of diagnosing or assessing, well, uh, age is a key uh, element when we work with children, we all know that. And then the comorbidity, given the fact that the brain is still developing um, and actually maturing, so the comorbidity, the co-occurrences and the development of these associations, they might differ. Uh, when a child uh, grows up um, is a key element and will actually keep hampering us in the generalizability. Now, um, different cutoffs have been used, especially in terms of typically developing children, what is a sleep problem, what is a sleep disorder. Um, it is quite often an indirect assessment. We rely on parents and different criteria are being used. And I remember when I first started um, with sleep disorder breathing, the apnea hypopnea being mixed. It swapped all over the place. <laughs> and I, I was in Dr. Gazal's group, you know, meeting guys, sleep disorder breathing. I was like, Dr. Gazal, you know, making consensus. But it's quite hard to see um, the, the, the criteria that are being used and the elements to define a problem or, or non problem aspect. So um, the child's input is of course key when you talk about sleep problems as my previous slide uh, showed, but it's not always easy and most of the questionnaire studies are mostly relying on parental uh, report. In terms of atypically developing children, the picture becomes more complex because of medical condition, the mental condition, the physical condition, the sensory aspects, the motor aspects will all add into uh, a different uh, uh, expression of potential sleep problem or sleep complaint. They might be quite focal uh, areas in the brain that are damaged and actually affect the sleep um, or just the regulation, sleep-wake cycle, the circadian rhythm, and they might be all diffuse and that actually gives another behavioral repertoire or profile. Another aspect is that tolerance. There are a few studies, but a couple of them show that parents of children with developmental disabilities have a different tolerance. And if, you, if they need to uh, describe a sleep problem in a child with a disability versus a child without a disability, you actually see that they are more uh, uh, sensitive or have a different perception of labeling uh, the sleep problem. They have throughout the years might have developed adaptive behaviors that, you know, uh, they are no longer aware of that it is an adaptive behavior and uh, that might uh, even reinforce the behavior of the child or might actually aid the whole issue or aid in throughout uh, a better sleep. So um, that actually will make it the generalizability uh, uh, difficult as well. In terms of dosage, I think Dr. Carlton will mention it as well, the dosage, the dosage of the medication uh, and the uh, adverse drug reactions um, is something that will make generalizability within this group uh, difficult as well. The psychosocial uh, uh, aspects. And then as a result, most of the sleep problems in these children are misdiagnosed or they have mixed ectologies, overdiagnosis, or there's an overestimation of their of the quality uh, of sleep. Sleep readiness, as I said, um, these children, because of have, being sleep deprived, of having poor sleep the night before, during the day might not be open, you know, to all those sleep promoting behaviors that you're trying to learn them or adjust to. So the sleep readiness might be different or variability in sleep intervals. The sleep architecture is changing. If you look at the sleep architecture of a child with red syndrome, you know, it's quite hard to score it. Um, and uh, paradoxically, when they have uh, issues with breathing during the day, they don't show them at night. So it makes it quite complex and sleep architecture is something uh, that is quite intriguing in children with atypical development. I'll show this again. Data and behavioral problems might interfere. The individual preferences might be different from environmental. If they need to sleep in special uh, uh, beds or uh, have certain treatment uh, equipment around them, ecological hygiene might be different. All these elements make this group of children quite uh, uh, challenging in terms of sleep studies. Food patterns, drinking patterns, as I said, those biological clocks, the living condition, 
uh, might actually all influence the sleep of these children and many, 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 many more. And I'm hoping that this group will eventually uh, uh, show them or elucidate uh, on these uh, issues. So um, I do not know how many parents are in the audience, but for those parents that are in the audience, I did my best to summarize uh, a little bit of the knowledge regarding sleep problems in children with an atypical development and what they can learn as well. First of all, it's quite common, very common, and probably you do not need me to tell you, um, but um, it's surprising that it, it, it is such a complaint that there's so little uh, research uh, ongoing. Um, so most of the complaints will be initiating and maintaining sleep, and the fact that the sleep-wake pattern is arrhythmic, and in some children the sleep circadian rhythm will actually flop or switch. Um, so somnolence is a key complaint, or daytime uh, sleepiness, as well as sleep disorder breathing, or because of their upper airway issues, they are more prone to sleep disorder breathing, and then they fall into those behavioral problems, as I've mentioned. The increase in total sleep time is quite often uh, seen. For example, in children with Angelman uh, syndrome, initiating and maintaining sleep uh, is um, uh, suggested, as well as uh, the awakenings at night. And then uh, movement, restless sleep, or even the restless leg syndrome uh, might pop up in these children with atypical development. Then you see the parasomnias that might, might uh, uh, show um, circadian rhythm disorders. In terms of prader ruby syndrome, what you might expect is again the sleepiness, uh, increased number of naps, the sleep disorder breathing issues, as well as an increased risk for narcolepsy. Initiating and maintaining uh, uh, sleep issues. Red syndrome, as I just said, um, is a decreased uh, number of REM periods, uh, sleep periods, which then is related to uh, memory and again openness to uh, behavioral uh, therapy and brain development. So decreased or uh, shortened so, uh, total sleep time, increased number of naps. Down syndrome, again initiating and maintaining sleep, sleep disorder breathing, circadian uh, rhythm issues, as well as an anxiety cause, something I forgot to mention. These children might have difficulties to go to sleep or resist to go to sleep because um, during night they have sensory aspects or it feels uncomfortable and that might, you know, um, make them reluctant to go to sleep. It's something we might not have questioned or considered. Um, Kiri Dusha is, and again, initiating, maintaining sleep, sleep disorder breathing, the parasomnias, anxiety again to go to sleep. The uh, Cornelia Belange, you have initiating, maintaining sleep. And then the uh, williams Byrne uh, initiating, maintaining sleep. So again, these insomnia the aspects that pop up, the uh, movement issues, the circadian rhythm problems, and again, the anxiety. The smith magenis uh, one is actually one of them at the top rank in terms of uh, sleep complaints um, because they have bursts of sleep with prolonged periods of uh, awakening, initiating, maintaining sleep issues, somnolence, the decreased total sleep time, circadian rhythm issues, then uh, pervasive developmental uh, syndrome if you have initiating, the awakenings, then the uh, movement issues, the sensory aspects, and a prolonged time to fall asleep, and then decreased uh, sleep offset latency. Metabolic neurodegenerative uh, disorders, again, the initiating complaint, so that always comes to the maintaining fall asleep, so the transition from that wake state to the sleep state, either biologically or environmentally or behaviorally uh, uh, induced uh, parasomnia, so sleep disorder breathing, the circadian again. The neuromuscular, of course, as I said, upper airway issues, so the sleep is breathing, initiating, and uh, maintaining. The cerebral palsy one is sleep weight transition problems, the initiating and maintaining. Children with paralysis, sleep disorder breathing. Children with asthma have sleep disorder breathing, decreased uh, sleep duration, and of course the awakening. So if sleep is not optimal in these children, their daytime behavior will not be optimal and will be, will be affected and we go on with potential vicious circle. 
a decrease at stage four, that restorative sleep. Cancer has been studied. Again, the awakenings, also the fact that sleep is not comfortable um, might actually prevent them from falling asleep, so initiating, maintaining sleep. And the number of wake time is actually increased, as well as the quality of sleep is increased. And as a result of the summons, the pain, it's again decreased number of uh, sleep duration, the quality of sleep is influenced, the awakenings are again there at night, initiating sleep and maintaining sleep, and potentially also the sleep before at three. So, um, The um, craniofacial aspects, again, the sleep disorder breathing, the uh, epilepsy, which is quite uh, uh, challenging in terms of scoring sleep. You have, again, uh, the architecture that is affected. And there are so many other things that we probably have not thought of uh, and still need to study in terms of syndromes or overlap of symptoms among these children that we might better understand from a sleep perspective. And that's why I put it like uh, this. Because there's a one tiny turning point, and that turning point each of these studies will mention is that the prevalence and the degree of a sleep problem equalizes actually the severity of the brain impairments. And it can be quite global and it can be quite pronounced uh, issues that pop up. So in terms of what we need to do is these adverse effects of chronic uh, sleep disorders on brain uh, development. And if you can see, I flipped it because to me, you don't only start from the syndrome and look at the sleep, but look at the sleep and see how they actually go back to certain syndromes where the overlaps are. Because to me, sleep to treat is a different viewpoint, a different perspective on the same brain, on the same child, in the same ecology, in the same context, same uh, genetic composition, but you look at nighttime behavior. So the effect of long-lasting sleep loss, I'm very sure that children in a with an atypical development will help us elucidate way much more of that sleep and sleep health tailored to their strengths and weaknesses in the future. So if I can summarize it in these children, again, the right brain matter, structural and functional and developmental profile, and in these children, all of these have, you know, there's a restriction, there's a deprivation, there's sleep is poor, fragmented, and so on. And it might be that the physiology, the sleep-wake pattern, the circadian rhythm, the comorbidity, the co-occurrences, everything again is that much interrelated and a few studies that have been done have not been able to elucidate the real uh, uh, turning points. So in these children, it is you know, quite often seen as an ine inevitable part of, of their condition. And so their developmental profile, only in terms of sleep, might be uh, very informative, especially their ind individual need and vulnerability. And it's quite, as anybody will say, overlooked either neglected or simply endured. Um, and so the treatment might be discouraged or discouraging to parents because it was not optimal, it just didn't fit the problem or the conditions uh, they were dealing with. So to then conclude, you know, these children have, you know, the desire, sleep when it is desired, expected and needed, doesn't always fall together. And that's where we with the sleep to treat need to come up with uh, solutions. So I think I have to round up since I see Osman standing. Um, so from a neurodevelopmental or a, a, a neuropsychological perspective, you see structural changes interrelated to these behavioral and functional changes. You don't only look at the chronological age, age as a psychologist, that's where you train that, but you should also look at the developmental age. I firmly believe that your children with atypical development, that is actually key in terms of brain development and their maturation. So sleep is off, by, and for the brain. Don't ever forget that. And then age at the time of the disorder, the age at the time of testing, time since the disorder, and the cognitive ability. So timing is crucial given the fact that brain maturation and brain development and child development should be seen as one. And then nature, severity, and chronicity, as well as short, medium, and long term, and especially that long term is important. 
and then the morbidities uh, that are there because that will actually help us define the frequency, the severity, as well as the chronicity. Brain the plasticity, I think uh, that speaks for itself. And then the last part is, of course, the context, you know, the context of parents that maybe endured or uh, have developed uh, adaptive behaviors. So that's quite important uh, to uh, stand still or reflect on as well. So I also want to allow me to a couple of minutes. So what we have done so far um, is through this scholarship, we have been fortunate to work on the fetal alcohol syndrome. And see the brains <laughs> that work with the data uh, right there, the students, they have, um, uh, we've been lucky to have a fetal alcohol uh, uh, syndrome uh, data, and also asked me last minute to flip in a couple of slides of this. So what we have been trying through this scholarship, my presence here, is that all of what I've said is interconnections, to disentangle this, so uh, make, to make sure that each professional that is involved within the care of children with uh, neurodevelopmental disability uh, to come to that common language. And so we've tried to make, uh, or at least tried to make a taxonomy of transitioning. Why transitioning? Because what I've just said in terms of that flip-flop, it is a passage from uh, one state or style to another one. And um, for me it is in terms of sleep to sleep, or sleep to wake, or wake to wake, or uh, wake uh, to uh, sleep. So it's that transitioning that is happening that we're trying to express in functional uh, terms, express in a taxonomy to help us understand um, better and talk in the same uh, language. So the process of changing. And what we have divided it into is cognition, behavior, emotion, sensory, motor health, and adaptive functions as sides of a cube. And so uh, inside, it's an imploded cube, you have the perspective of the child, the caregiver, the professional, and uh, the others that can be advocators, that can be funding, uh, or pharmacy, uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies. So that cube will allow us to come uh, to analysis because we understand each part of these uh, transitioning or each part of these uh, state transitioning in, an, uh, in a similar way. And then hopefully we can develop strategies. So, so the child, the, prof uh, the parent, the professional, and on the other side you have the uh, others. Huh? So in terms of cognition, which will be subdivided in certain uh, uh, details or sub certain uh, uh, detailed functions, um, same with emotion is the other side of the cube. Behavior is another side of the cube. Um, health is another side of the cube. To just make everybody that is involved with the children come to kind of a self-awareness that we actually look at the same child, but each from their discipline, occupational therapist, psychologist, an MD, and that we look at these sides in a similar way and divide the functions so eventually we can come up with strategies. And the data that we had at hand, and I think Osmond will show them, uh, has been analyzed already in the first stage throughout that uh, model. So uh, I think I'll let, leave this out. Uh, we've, done, we've done this in terms of, of the, the, the text mining as well, but I think Osmond will explain it more. Okay. So I think I need to put the last slide on, the most important one, this one. Thanks to everybody uh, for, uh, first of all, listening and um, the Peter Wall for uh, sponsoring this and uh, that for the data. I know I've talked for a long time, I'm going to do my best to answer shortly, although I cannot promise. Um, uh, okay, uh, how do you feel about the regular use of melatonin? Well, um, a very honest question. An answer to that is, first of all, um, I'm quite skeptical about giving medication to children. Um, uh, but I'm a psychologist, so in Belgium, a psychologist is not allowed to give any medications uh, or anything, uh, prescribe anything to a child. Now, in terms of melatonin in Belgium, melatonin is not over the counter. In the US, I learned it's over the counter. And now I'm kind of addicted to it, if I can express it that way because I'm traveling a lot, so um, regular use. Uh, uh, as I said, in terms of prescriptions, my preference as a psychologist, and I have to promote my own field, is I go for the behavioral therapy, go for um, 
the behavioral, the environmental aspects, and my last resort would be uh, melatonin and uh, the regular use. Um, you know, just watch carefully and observe the behavior um, uh, in that aspect. Now, what I would like to stress again, I talked about that circadian rhythm and I talked about the sleep homeostasis and I talked about those external elements. And those are actually the elements that you need to keep track of. Uh, if you give melatonin or if you don't give melatonin or if you do anything that, uh, in terms of uh, treatment, behavior treatment. Yes. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I would like to give to that a comment as the doctor who sees in BC kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities. Melatonin has its values for sure, but it should be given its used as an over the counter medication here. It should be a prescription medication and it should be prescribed after a full assessment, otherwise, it may cover certain underlying uh, issues. And I think that would be quite inappropriate. And we see that quite often that kids get melatonin as shown, cloning in blah blah blah, without a formal assessment, and we are very afraid of this process. Um, and also, there's one study I think by Lisa Meltzer, um, and they did a retrospective chart review of uh, uh, in, in primary care physicians or physicians uh, and see, address, and looked at if they uh, addressed sleep issues and what medication then has been used or prescribed. And it's astonishing that, you know, in the US there's no, uh, uh, eight, uh, how do you call it? The American, no, 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 the American Association of, oh gosh, the, no, 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 for prescription, oh, it slips my mind, jet lag. So, um, uh, F FASD, no, F, FDA. FDA, 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 that's it, FDA, uh, uh, approved um, medication for or prescribed uh, medication for, for children even though it was huge, you know, antihistamines that were uh, being used, even things that are not, not really over the counter, but people just experiment and try to have their child fall asleep, so um, I think that's another thing that needed to be uh, noted. And then is there a known effects of sleep on epilepsy? Well, I think the, the roots of, of uh, sleep and, and the interest of neurologists in sleep actually starts with uh, epilepsy uh, syndromes and epilepsy uh, problems. Uh, it is uh, challenging and yes, uh, there is, uh, and there's a lot of uh, paper and publications uh, regarding it. Okay, do you need that? Anything? No, it's quite clear uh, that epilepsy is triggered or initiated by Sleep and, uh, yeah. and, and the treatment of one is affecting the other one. So, um, and then should all children with neurodevelopmental disabilities have screening uh, given the known high incidence? Well, as I said in my slide, you know, the, the sufferer, the complainant, and actually the observant might be different. And um, uh, I think it starts with, with the healthcare professional being aware and questioning about it. Um, that opens up the discussion, but in terms of, of having the screening, the assessment, and the treatment, I think that needs to be done with mutual agreement. But I, I think most parents will be open to find a solution to any sleep issue uh, popping up. So uh, it starts with, with awareness. Um, I think, yeah, want to add something? I would love, because this is exactly the key question we are trying to address with our report to the Ministry as well as health authorities. We believe that there is a consensus among clinicians, researchers uh, who work in the area of FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, that every healthcare professional dealing with this case should be able to do a simple sleep screening. So if you are a social worker, or a psychologist, behavioral therapist, occupational therapist, or a pediatrician, you should know how to screen. Whether you go to further courses and get more skills and uh, uh, train uh, to get trained to make real comprehensive sleep assessments or not, that's another question. But every healthcare professional dealing with a child with challenging disruptive daytime behaviors should be able to screen for sleep disorders. 
and we are promoting for that, we are advocating for that, and our, we believe it's not about a referral to a center, it should be a button-up concept. But we will discuss that further uh, during the, uh, the round table, I assume, or at the end and tomorrow. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's an awareness. It's an awareness within the healthcare professionals. It's an awareness among schools, teachers, uh, I gave once a lecture in school psychology, and it's, it's amazing how little is known uh, about sleep in, in teachers um, when it's quite uh, important that a child is alert and, and aware of what is ongoing, open to, to learning experiences. So um, the awareness, that's the key, and that's where everybody jumps in, you know, as a parent, as, as a healthcare professional, you know, uh, everybody jumps in uh, in terms of sleep and sleep screening. Okay. Um, any other questions? to advocate and, and push the agenda even further on. Uh, I understand that correctly. So, um, what, what, how, how you deal in how that? In that well, how in, I hop a lot of countries and so um, I see many cultural differences and I think um, putting the agenda of sleep forward internationally is, is, is done by all the sleep organizations by creating a sleep day, sleep awareness day. Um, I, I started 15 years ago and at that time pediatric sleep, you know, I, I couldn't count on my two hands people that were interested you know, in it and it just grew and grew and grew and now the group is already bigger. I see cultural changes, I see within the world places uh, putting sleep as a, as a day on the agenda, a sleep awareness day or a sleep day or an international sleep day. Um, in, in, in China, for example, um, I see um, the importance of sleep um, uh, or the importance given to sleep changing in the light of a, of, of a culture that puts high emphasis on learning and, and performing and competition. In Belgium, for example, um, given the obesity epidemic, which I was confronted with in Chicago, the obesity epidemic, I see that's another push uh, forward. Um, in the Netherlands, I worked with a group uh, specifically on children with red syndrome, um, because uh, how to score sleep, you know, when there's a lot of epilepsy ongoing at night, and you cannot really differentiate between these uh, stages. Um, um, so, um, how to address this and how to, to, to bring this forward and, and specifically from Belgium. It, is, it starts with all these separate organizations within Europe and um, the Pediatric uh, Sleep, International Pediatric Sleep Association is one that really uh, uh, puts our voice outside because sleep is not only children, it is the whole adult lifespan area as well. And there's, if you think of how many people that are having issues with sleep and how much sleep medication is prescribed in an adult world, you can see what drives that discipline. So in terms of, of pediatrics, it's a smaller group, but we are being hurt and we, over these 15 years, I see you know, our group growing and different disciplines getting involved into it. Um, and I, I think Osman has, has a big deal uh, in it as well to, to bring the agenda of children and neurodevelopmental disability forward as well. And you see it locally in Belgium, 
but also in other places. Now, because of, of, of this, I told in Shanghai I'm going to go to Vancouver because I'm in scholarship and I'm working on, on neurodevelopmental disabilities, you know. Their interest starts as well in terms of children with an atypical development. So it's moving forward, not as fast as it should be, but it's moving forward in each piece. Is, 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 or each country or each cultural is, is helping in that aspect. And did I address your question? Yeah, I guess I, guess I was just hoping that, because we've seen so much done in Europe, we were, I was kind of hoping that maybe you'd be able to say that in Europe they are dealing effectively with that and are thoughtful and not very early issues with children. There's continuity from schools to, uh, to OR time uh, for, for dealing with these problems. Uh, I, just, I guess I was just hoping to hear maybe that there's some light there that we might be able to look at. I think yes. there is one point, Les, uh, uh, there is one point, I think in Europe, monopoly situations are less. There are several, usually the countries are a little bit smaller, you know, United 2.6 times, you have to multiplicate United Germany with 2.6 in order to get to the geographic area of British Columbia, and you have there about, I think, 40 or 50 universities, you have around 100 level 3 to level 4 hospitals and there is more competition so the service is also provided in a different way. I think when we review the situation here we have to see the monopoly situation Canadian pediatric hospitals have in the various provinces, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that the Canadian system enables, empowers actually healthcare professionals to step in but changing this top-down concept has not happened yet. And the question is how can we change a top-down concept to a more button-up where every healthcare professional is able to do a screening and, and how we can uh, fuel this discussion. That's, I think, what's coming up. And also you need to, you know, if you look at the history of pediatric sleep, it actually peaked because of sudden infant death syndrome. A sudden infant death syndrome and um, that actually provoked a discussion of sleep apnea and then we're back into sleep disorder breathing which is like the top researched one it's only because a psychologist came in and other disciplines came in it just broadened the whole field of pediatric sleep so it, it, it might look to the outside world like we've been doing this for ages you know but it's not the case you know it's a small selected group and it's growing rapidly, but there's still, as I said, many, the, the, the papers that I showed, there's just the, the, the scheme, it's just, uh, you know, maybe 30, 50 papers maximum that is dealing with these topics, so um, there's still much to be done. But I think we are now coming to the, really to the panel discussion, uh, because there is, the question is how should we discuss, how should we approach this public discussion? It's not an issue which one profession can uh, lead and uh, spearhead. It will not work. So we are coming to the panel discussion. I would like to invite uh, Kerstin and uh, Dr. Lori Dutchenkoff to come and um, start with inviting the members to give statements and really open up for a collaborative uh, 